Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the webinar, Flow Your Career, Find Clarity and Ease in Your Career Path with our presenter, Layla Hawk. My name is Cassie Potosky and I'm the Assistant Director of Career Advancement for your Northwestern Alumni Association. We'll begin shortly and we're so excited that Layla could join us for this great topic, but first there's a few housekeeping items I'd like to share with you. On the right hand side, you will see that there are a few different tabs. Um, please feel free to send in um, your thoughts through the chat box. I know people are already sending in um, where they're tuning in from today, so thank you all for sharing. Um, and Layla does have plans to utilize that chat box throughout the presentation. Um, if you have questions specifically, um, you can send those in through the Q&A tab, and we will take those throughout the presentation as well as at the end. Should you experience any technical issues during the webinar, you can email the Big Marker team for further assistance at support at bigmarker.com. And lastly, a link to access the recording of the webinar will be sent to all registrants later today. Now let's move on to why we're all here. Layla Hawk helps successful mid-career professionals reinvigorate their motivation for work and confidently pursue the next steps in their career. After a successful nine-year legal career, Layla realized she was headed quickly towards success in a profession she no longer wanted to pursue. After founding Alignment Coaching in 2015, she now inspires and encourages her clients to take charge of their career journey in a way that supports the life and future they want. With nine years of corporate experience, Layla understands where her clients are coming from and draws on that along with traditional coaching principles to help her clients make deliberate strategic choices today that set them up for success down the road. Um, and Layla also just started a new role, so I don't know if you want to share some of that, but thank you so much for being here and I will pass it off to you. Yeah, thank you, Cassie. Um, I am having a lot of fun actually seeing where everyone's coming from. We have someone from Italy, which is awesome. Um, it's later in the day for you, which is nice. Um, but yeah, thank you for that introduction. I'm really excited to be presenting on this. This is one of my favorite topics based on one of my favorite professional books um, and really the path toward happiness in your career. So um, let's just dive in. I, as Cassie mentioned, I do want this to be interactive uh, and you'll have time to actually uh, do some exercises. So try to have a pen and paper handy. I'm a fan of pen and paper over the computer, but um, uh, both will work just so you can actually tangibly write some stuff down. Uh, just briefly, um, a, a bit about me, Cassie already mentioned this, but I, I got my JD from Northwestern. I practice law. I got my coaching certificate while I was still practicing law because I realized I was on a path that wasn't happy for me, which we'll talk a little bit about today. Um, and I've been coaching for the past three years, the successful mid-career professionals really on this career path uh, trajectory that we're going to be talking about today. So setting up your career path, finding focus, setting clear goals. And just in January, as Cassie mentioned, I uh, joined Diversity Lab. So Diversity Lab is an organization that works with primarily law firms, although we work with other professional services industries as well, to promote and boost diversity through really innovative, action-oriented ways using data and behavioral science. So I still get to coach a lot in this role and actually do um, more professional development. And um, it's all around a topic that I'm really passionate about, which is diversity and um, in a very professional setting. So that's fun. If you have any questions about that, feel free to email me. I'll um, Actually, Cassie, will you share my email address after this? And I know I, I'll put it on the screen, but will you share that with um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll throw that in our um, follow up email. I'll make a note of that. And so everybody can have that information. Great. Thanks. Yeah. OK, enough about me. Um, let's move on to why you're all here, which is actually to talk about your careers and try to find some focus in there. So what are we talking about today? What is flow? So flow is a concept named and defined by psychologist Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, which I have practiced saying so many times. Um, Mihaly was studying happiness in the 70s and 80s. He had a really groundbreaking approach. He was using the brand new technology of pagers uh, where he could get real time in the moment feedback on how people were feeling. It was called the experience sampling method. Uh, and what he would do is he would page participants in his studies and ask them to write down how they felt and what they were thinking about at the moment he paged them. So it was really the first time we were getting some real time information about how people were feeling throughout their days. What he found was that people were happiest, not in the leisure time, watching TV after work, not when they were having fun with friends, although that often was the case, but it wasn't pr the primary activity. 
they were happiest when they were in the zone, when they were absorbed in an activity, often, though not always, at work. So you can imagine for a psychologist studying happiness, this was quite shocking to find out that people were actually in the moment happiest at work, right? Um, and he came to define this state, this in the zone state, as when an experience itself is so enjoyable that people will do it for the sheer sake of doing it, often at great cost. And it's when the state in which nothing else seems to matter, what you're really focused on is all that matters. So um, many, we'll talk about some kind of practical examples and we'll talk about what it feels like often. I'm sure even just seeing this, you probably can identify some experiences where you felt this way. And for the record, you know, what Hi, Layla. I think we lost your audio. Um, maybe just try and see if you can turn that your microphone back on in the top right hand corner of your screen. Sorry about that, everyone. No, that's can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Awesome. Okay. Um, so I will I will go back. I was just saying I'm not advocating that we find this strong sense of flow um, so that we pursue our careers at all costs. That's not a very holistic approach to life, which I really do believe in. Um, but what the psychologist discovered was that many people were happiest in this condition. And typically it's found and spoken of in terms of very, I call it like the micro flow, a, a, a particular activity. So when you get in the zone, you get lost in your work. But what Mihaly says in his book, his book is called Flow, by the way. It's a great book. It's a little academic and heady, but it's wonderful. Um, but what he says is whenever the goal is to improve the quality of life, the flow theory can point the way. So, of course, as I think about careers and um, having helping people find happiness in their careers, this piqued my interest. So we're going to try to apply the same principles of flow um, into your careers and, and just to get you out of your head about a bit so you feel like you're in the zone of your career and ultimately improve the quality of life as it relates to your career, which, of course, as I'm sure all of you on the call know, is a huge part of your life. Your career is becoming more and more a part of your life these days. So we might as well try and um, find some happiness there. So you know what flow is. What does it take to actually get flow? What are the conditions of flow? I'm going to breeze through these really quickly on this slide, and then we're going to dive deeper into each of them um, later on. So don't um, don't be surprised or don't you know freak out if you if you missed anything. <laughs> So the first is clear goals. So in order to find flow, you have to have you have to understand your goals and you have to know where you're headed. And um, this is really important. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. I'm a huge proponent of goal setting, not necessarily for the achievement piece, but because clear goals help focus your efforts. So clear goals is really important when you're find, trying to find flow. Uh, another condition required for flow is immediate meaningful feedback. So importantly, when I talk about feedback here, I'm not talking about feedback from colleagues or bosses or, um, or you know, your performance reviews, but uh, really actually finding feedback that, that helps you understand whether or not you're on the path to achieving your goals. Just a, a side note, I see one person, Julia, um, says the audio is choppy. Is anyone else having that issue? Or Cassie, are you having that issue? Um, Layla, you're coming through clear for people who are listening in. If you try to refresh your browser or close out all of your other tabs, that will uh, typically make the audio more clear. Awesome. Thanks. Great. Um, okay. So this immediate meaningful feedback is feedback that tells you whether or not you are on the path to achieve your goal. So I don't want you to think about this as, um, you know, performance reviews, typical corporate performance reviews that we tend to go to when we hear the word feedback. Another condition for flow that we're going to talk about is the skills meeting the challenge. So skills are really important when you are defining your career. It's a pillar in the framework I've designed that kind of guides my coaching. And this is why, because in order to find flow and in order to find this focus on your career, your skills have to meet the challenge. And it's that meeting of challenge that's really important. It's not just about having skills. It's not just about developing skills that you want to developing to develop, but it's about those skills actually meeting the challenge ahead of 
of you so that you're not bored, um, but also so that you're not overly, um, you're in so that you're not in over your head and you can't achieve your goals and you get a lot of anxiety. And we'll talk about that as we dive deeper into that one. Um, another requirement is this ability to focus. So in your career, that looks like not getting distracted by the latest career path or shift in the working world, which is happening so often. I was just talking with a colleague last night about this, how challenging it is these days to focus on one path. Um, you know, we're both running our own business. So how do you actually focus on what you're doing? Uh, obviously, when I made the shift to diversity lab, I, I, I took this into account and said, you know, is this what I want? Am I being distracted or is this really what I'm looking for? So that ability to focus is really important. And I think a, a huge reason why there's so much anxiety in people's careers these days, because there are there's so much noise and there's so much opportunity that we are getting a little overwhelmed by the paradox of choice. So the ability to focus um, is really important when you're trying to find flow. And then finally, having a sense of control. This is another one of my favorite topics, focus, control. Um, you have to at least think you're in control in order to find flow, whether it's true or not. And again, the changing economy, the changing world, so many people feel like they have no control over their careers. So we'll talk about how to get that sense of control back into your career and ultimately your life so you can get the benefits of the feelings of flow. So when you have all of these conditions and you really do need all of them in order to find flow, then you're set up to receive the benefits that define flow. And what are these benefits of flow? Um, you know, the first is everyday worries and frustrations are gone. I wish that I could promise you that after this webinar, everyday worries and frustrations would be gone. I can't. But the way that I like to think about this in your career is when you have flow in your career, you don't sweat the small stuff. Um, this is, you, you get to lose this kind of focus on the little things because flow activities require complete concentration. So usually we have so many little worries and frustration because our time isn't spent on activities that require all of our focus. And this is where I want your career become your focus, but on a much larger, grander scale, the trajectory of your career so that you don't have to worry about, you know, the distractions of other potential paths and you're not focused on the little things. You're very focused on the trajectory of your career and you can find that flow in your career path. Uh, to do that, to, to get to this benefit, we really need to um, define some clearly structured demands on our career. And what that does is impose order on our consciousness. And that's really what flow is looking for, order of consciousness. So you know your brain knows what you're focused on. I we, When we started this, we should have done it over under on how many times I'm going to say the word focus because it's a to favorite topic of mine and it's huge in flow. But that's really, that focus leads us to order of consciousness. and that why uh, flow leads to more satisfaction and happiness in life. So benefits, everyday worries and frustrations are gone. Um, the self disappears yet emerges stronger. And this is a really big one too. So this is where you start to lose your sense of ego. And it comes from the prior conditions that we're going to go through individually. It really becomes almost like a type, the activity itself almost becomes like a type of meditation or what some people might call enlightenment, but you, you have a single focus and it's not yourself. And so often it's yourself that gets in the way of finding happiness. So how do you get that? How does the self disappear yet emerge stronger? So there's little energy to be wasted on thinking about uh, what other people think about you or what you should be doing. You're again, so focused on the activity on, at hand and at achieving the goals. And then importantly, it's not a loss of self, but it's a loss of consciousness of the self. So in doing so, by losing this consciousness of yourself, you allow yourself to become a different, more expansive being. And that's how you begin to emerge stronger. So I'm not sure if you've ever had an experience where you look back and you and you think, wow, how did I do that? That is this kind of benefit of flow. You you have no idea you were in the zone. You weren't focused on yourself. You were focused on the activity. And yet you come out of this activity and you are a stronger, um, more well-rounded, more complex human being than you were before. And that's a huge benefit of flow. And I think we would all agree something that we're looking for in our careers. We're looking to grow through our careers. That's what makes us happy. 
And then finally, another benefit is the sense of time is altered. Um, this is a cool one. It's obviously a little more uh, relevant in an activity itself on the micro scale of flow, um, but it does happen in uh, on the macro scale too. So on the micro scale, I'm not sure um, if you've ever been so lost in an activity or a problem. This used to happen to me a lot in law school. I would, you know, plan to schedule for two or study for two hours, and then all of a sudden it's 2 a.m. and my bedtime's normally nine. I can't believe it. What's happening? This, um, you kind of lose this sense of time when time is not important. So when the activity doesn't center around time, the sense of time is altered. It either goes by quickly or it feels like you've been studying for hours in a good way. Interestingly, when time is, is an important component of the activity, like with surgeons or runners, their sense of time is actually heightened. So the sense of time being altered um, depends on the activity, but it's a really cool benefit of like actually being able to alter the feeling of time passing when you find this flow activity in this flow state. So these are, so we talked about the conditions and the benefits. We're going to dig deeper into the conditions. So I, I just want to show you some pretty um, typical activities in which people find flow a lot. So I've got rock climbing here. Really, I'm thinking any activity where that's physically demanding and where your life is on the line. Um, you're focused because if you fall or if you're thinking about yourself or if you're thinking about anything else, then you could die <laughs> or really hurt yourself. So you lose track of time. Your goal is clear. You're heading towards the top and you know a misstep can be harmful. So you have to focus all of your energy on the activity and the task at hand. Another um, flow activity, and I mentioned this already, but is surgery. There's actually a really cool chapter in Mihaly's book called Flow on surgery and about how it's the perfect flow job because everyone is working towards the same goal. So it's not just an order of um, self-consciousness, but it's an order of consciousness of the team. It's clear what that goal is, right? You're trying to fix a problem or save someone's life. You know exactly when something goes wrong. So that's this feedback mechanism I discussed briefly because there are machines and the body gives quite obvious feedback when something goes wrong. Uh, it's, it's really structured to find flow. Another flow activity is sports, any sports. I've got tennis here, but really any sports, because again, you have clear feedback and the feedback you have in sports is a point system. You know, if you're winning, you know, if you're losing, you know, if you're doing better, you know, if you're doing worse by your points. You also know what it takes to win. You know what you're trying to do. If it's a team sport, just like surgery, again, everyone's working for the same goal and you have to focus to be in that game and to be progressing towards your goal. And then finally, I mentioned this as well, um, studying. So studying or working hard, trying to understand a deep, complex problem when you can get lost in that problem and time seems to be altered. You know your goal. You have clear feedback because you're either um, understanding the problem better or not. And, and you're focused. Uh, it's, it's harder these days on computers, for sure, with the Internet. Um, but if you can find this time to carve out and really focus on any sort of problem, then you'll be in, it's easier to find that flow zone. This is where I get to pause from talking and ask if you guys have, if anyone on the call in the chat wants to chat in, can you think of other experiences where you've experienced a flow state or that might be flow activities or even some that are here that um, you kind of recognize in having experienced that? I'll just give a, a few seconds. Oh, yeah, totally, Melissa. I can see that. Putting together puzzles, coding. Yeah, Glenn, I can really see that. I'm, I can only see. Oh, there we go. Um, because you're so in the zone and that goal is clear. You have to focus. I'm assuming when you're coding, you can't be like surfing the Internet on other tabs. Yeah, Paul, running marathons, playing piano. Awesome. These are great. So you see all of the conditions we went through, clear goals, you know, in playing piano, you're trying to get to perfection in playing it. You have the feedback, it sounds good or it doesn't. <laughs> your skills have to meet your challenge. So we'll talk a little bit about how that might play out in piano, so that's a great example. Um, your um, your focus, you have to focus to be there. Uh, so th these, are, these are really great examples, guys, thank you. Um, and I'm glad that you recognize the feeling and you can kind of lose yourself in it because that's what we're going for on a grander scale.
So what makes those activities that you guys mentioned and these on the slide in front of you flow activities is that they were actually designed to create a flow experience. They have rules that provide structure. They have clear goals. They offer immediate feedback and, and the skills match the challenge. And so much of why we get in our heads and distracted by all of the competing opponents of work is because we didn't spend the upfront time to get the conditions of our careers right. So that's what we're going to do today because it turns out flow activities, they can, flow activities, excuse me, they can spontaneously occur, but they actually don't that often. Flow typically comes about because the activity was designed to create flow, which I, I think you would agree, certainly our career paths just no longer are. There's so much distraction like we've talked about. There's so much change. I think the phrase career path might not even be relevant anymore because it's so different for everyone. And so what we want to do today is actually step back, consider the conditions of flow, consider how to get them into your career right now, even though it's not perfect. I want, I want you to be thinking about it and then see if you can continue to think about it and find that stronger sense of flow in your career. And this is, you know, this really forms the foundation for so much of what I do with my coaching clients. So I'm excited to be sharing it with a broader audience. Um, and, and again, so Cassie, and I, my email address, I'll put it up here. If you do have any questions that you don't feel comfortable chatting in, just let me know. But Right now, let's dive in to the conditions. So the first condition is clear goals. It's the most straightforward, but definitely not the easiest. Um, it's, it's one of those like simple but easy. Yeah, we get how to set clear goals. We get what clear goals are, but actually setting them and um, sticking to them is quite challenging. So why, are, why is it challenging? Well, the first uh, component is your goal has to be meaningful to you. It can't be trivial. And of course, I see this a lot in my um, career coaching. <laughs> I, I felt it for myself, for sure. Um, we tend to pick career goals that are trivial to us, but they're put on us by society or cultural norms, or maybe we got this degree, so we feel like we have to do this. And it turns out we don't actually really care about it. And that's when we start to lose that excitement and interest in our careers. Um, when I was a lawyer, I, you know, I was in-house for most of my career. So a natural goal of mine was to progress through the in-house ranks. I was senior counsel um, to move to associate general counsel and then general counsel. And I saw that it was very achievable for me, which is one of, which is the next requirement. But I didn't care. It was so trivial to me because I, I didn't care about it. And it really didn't help me find flow. Now, what's interesting is once I clarified what I really wanted, I stepped back. I said, OK, I'm on this awesome path that so many people would be happy about. Why am I not happy? I decided what I really want. I realized the goal was trivial to me, even though I didn't shift roles immediately. Right. I, I started doing my coaching school. I started looking at my lawyer job to find how I was honing in my coaching skills and vice versa, that made my lawyer job much more enjoyable. Because even though I didn't have to change it, I had a goal to focus my attention and to kind of reframe my work in this career path that ultimately, you know, wasn't what I wanted to be on, but it's still just having that clear goal really helped shift my perspective. So clear goals, non-trivial that are meaning for you, meaningful to you, achievable. We'll talk more about this when we get to the skills meets challenge requirement. But you do want to make sure that the goals you set are something you can actually achieve. It's within your realm. It's within your control. Again, we'll talk about that in the sense of control um, condition too. But something that you can do. So this is really, can I actually achieve this goal? And then finally, a time bound. So this is kind of straight from the SMART goals um, framework, if you've ever heard of that. Um, this time bound sense of goal just creates a sense of urgency. So it's not just kind of out there and you actually uh, are moving towards it and taking action towards it. So what I want you to do is an exercise. I'm going to limit you a little here so you don't get overwhelmed, but this is going to form the foundation of creating these conditions of flow in the next year in your career. So I want you to think and actually write down, uh, you know, what do you most want in the next year in your career? And I'll give you just a few minutes to write that down. Not a few minutes, probably a minute to write that down. And if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to chat in and I'll answer them.
importantly, as you're considering this goal, I want you to be honest, right? So is it leaving your career path that you're on right now? Is it making $10,000 more in the next year? Is it only working three days a week? Really make this something that is not trivial to you, but that is meaningful that you really want because otherwise the goal doesn't work. And then once you've got that goal written down, I want you to ask yourself, is it achievable? You know, can I, can I actually get there? If not, it won't be meaningful. So if it's not achievable, back it off. So let's say your goal is to work three days by the end of next year. Okay, well, that's probably not realistic. Maybe working four days a week, I can do that. So back it off a little bit if it's not achieve, achievable. And then finally, this is really the most important part to write down. Why is it meaningful to you? In other words, what makes it non-trivial? What will it help you feel, uh, get to achieve um, that is that you, that is really meaningful to you in your life? Okay, and then we're going to move on. So hopefully you have a very clear goal for the next year that's meaningful you, full to, to you that you know you can achieve because we're going to continue this thread throughout the, um, throughout the remainder of the webinar. So um, if you don't have that, right, multitask a little bit. I never advocate for that, but do. And I'll move on to the next component, the next condition of flow, which is feedback. So Feedback is so closely tied with clear goals. Um, your feedback system is how you know whether you are winning. And this winning is against yourself or against achieving your goals. So it's simple. It's a measure of success against your goals. Measure of progress against your goal. Um, it needs to be immediate or at least regular, because if you get too far down the road without feedback, you risk being too far off track. So I mentioned sports as, and points in sports as a really great way, um, kind of very clear measure of feedback. Imagine if in sports, you didn't get the score until halfway through the game, wouldn't be a very good, interesting game. It wouldn't be an, an, an interest or a uh, effective means of feedback. So you need to make this consistent and um, immediate if possible. Um, and it needs to be measuring that progress against your goal. And again, it has to be meaningful. So, and by meaningful here though, I mean, it has to be actually getting you closer to your goal. So if your goal is, again, let's say your goal is to work three days of, um, three days a week by the end of the year, you need to make sure that you're actually measuring your progress against your goals. So by the end of the first quarter, have I been able to take a half a day off a week? By the end of six months, am I one day down? So is it actually getting you closer to your goal? Or maybe it's having conversations with your boss. Maybe it's moving through the HR system. Anything that will help you actually measure um, whether or not you're getting closer to achieving your goal. And that's what helps you make adjustments. So continuing the exercise from the prior slide, I want you to take the goal that you set for the year and ask yourself, how will you know? How will you know if you are on track to achieve your goal? How will you measure it? So there are a number of ways to measure. You can track on a calendar. This is often called the Seinfeld method. Um, actually, he said it's not attributed to him or he never said it, but the Seinfeld method is, you know, a, the folklore goes, he decided to write a joke every day and he marked off on his calendar every day he wrote a joke. And then once you get a string of like 20 days, you don't want to quit because it feels good to have that string. So how will you actually measure this? You could do it on a calendar. Um, you could uh, measure progress. You know, if it's money that you're trying to increase, are you getting more money? You could have red and green days. You could have a journal. And then finally, how often, when and how often will you measure? So I want you to think right here for a few minutes about a feedback system, how you will know if you're progressing against your goals, how you will measure, and when and how often you will measure that will help you know whether or not you're on the right track. So just take, oh, about one minute here to write that down. Uh, think about it and write it down and ask any questions um, if you have any.
Awesome. And this can continue to evolve. Uh, it's it's hard, especially with a less tangible uh, sort of goal, um, less uh, quantifiable, I guess is a better word, uh, goal. So continue to evolve. But all of this, uh, this feedback system gets to one of my favorite topics, which Cassie knows, because I've talked about it probably on every webinar, um, is a work journal. So I'm a big advocate of having a work journal because the work journal is meant to identify whether you are on track and still happy with the progress in your career. And it forces you to confront whether or not you're getting too far off track or you're far away. Um, it, it's just sort of a daily simple check in on your career. And that's what this feedback system is all about. OK, next condition is the skills meet the challenge. So um, this is important because if you're too, um, if you're into over your head then you tend to just kind of shut down and if you are overly skilled and the challenge isn't really there, then you get bored. So I put this picture of chess here because over the past year I decided to start learning chess. And um, when I first started, I had no idea how the pieces even moved, right? I'm just understanding their, the rules was really challenging for me. And my husband is a chess champion. He was like one top in the nation when he was in high school. And um, he was quite bored and we were trying to play each other and I would get angry and frustrated and quit a lot. It was a good marital test. <laughs> But now I've taken some time to get to know it and I enjoy it. My husband, when we first started playing, he was bored. We were doing very basic rudimentary exercises and he kept saying he couldn't wait until I got to the point where he had to think because he had the skills, but he had no challenge. And um, Mihaly Chikmet Saheli demonstrates this in his book and cautions against the conundrum that my husband and I were in, right? Th this is the graph um, that he uses to identify this place where the sk skills meet the, cha the challenge, and there is a fairly narrow flow channel. So if you think about that chess situation, when I first started, I was at A3. I was probably actually way above A3 where my skills were very low and my anxiety and the challenge was very hard. Um, and I was anxious and I shut down and I just quit a lot. So what I needed to do was to get to the flow channel by either increasing my skills or decreasing the challenge or both. And both is what I chose to do. So I started reading books on chess. I started doing exercises. Um, and, and chess puzzles that helped increase my skill. And then I began playing online um, games for beginners or against players at a similar level. Uh, so I decreased the challenge and I increased my skills. And now I love it when I'm playing someone who's at my level because I feel like, you know, I can get in the zone and I can lose hours playing chess now. But that took me some adjustment from my initial, um, initial approach. My husband, on the other hand, he was at A2. And truly, he was probably way further to the right where he, he had high skills and a low challenge and he was bored. And that's why he kept on saying he wanted me to get to the point where he had to think. He's obviously not going to decrease his skills. That's not a move you want to do or maybe even can do. But he needed he wanted me to increase the challenge for him. So he wanted us to get to A4. We're getting there. We're not quite there. <laughs> but this is how it goes in your career. So we want you to find the flow zone where the challenge meets the skills and vice versa. So again, with regard to the goal you set for the next year on the first slide or in the first condition, I want to know, do you have what it takes? Do you have the necessary skills to achieve your goal? And just for a few seconds here, be really honest about that. And if you do have what it takes, then you need to ask yourself, is the challenge appropriate? So is the challenge too much? Will you be in high anxiety? Or is the challenge too low? Will you be bored? Does the challenge stretch your skills a bit? And, and it can help to actually sort of plot yourself on this graph. And then when you've got those answered, if you're not in the flow zone, what will it take? How will you increase your skills in an actionable way? So not just get better at, but how will you get better? You can create little um, micro problems. You can volunteer. If, if you want to increase your leadership skills, you can volunteer, um, serve on a board. 
Or how will you amplify the challenge so you aren't bored? If your skills are way above the challenge, what will you do to make it more challenging? And I want you to think, take a, about a minute here. Think of real tangible ways to improve your skills or to increase the challenge so that you are still growing. And this is what helps you become that more complex self at the end of a flow activity. And any questions on how to find this kind of sweet spot where the flow meets the challenge or how to increase your skills or how to amp up the challenge in your career? You can, you can feel free to give specific examples or, um, or just general questions here if you have any. Yeah, Layla, yeah, Layla this is, this is um, question for you. Um, you talk about being high anxiety. How do you know um, what your max is and how much you can do if you don't push yourself to that breaking point? Is there another way to find out when you're beyond your capacity um, other than kind of hitting hitting a wall? Mm, that's a good question. Um, well, you know, I'm gonna say work journal, but... <laughs> <laughs> Really, I mean, you have to play with that, right? You start to notice where um, where you get stressed out or want to shut down. Um, there, there's kind of two ways to get to that anxiety, right? There's burnout, which is I've spoken of a lot um, in the working world these days because it's so prevalent. Um, but there's also just shutting down, you know, where I can't, I can't, I don't even know where to start, so I'm just not going to, um, and. Unfortunately, I don't know that there is a, there's not a formula by any means. I think you have to play with it and you have to really pay attention. And that's where the feedback system comes so, um, so much into play because you have to be checking in with that feedback regularly to know if you're moving towards the path to anxiety or boredom. Um, mm -hmm. And just as an aside, you know, sometimes those A3 and A2 places aren't necessarily bad to be in your career. You know, I have one client who, you know, she was, she was quite bored at her job, but that was okay because she was trying to have a family and, and kind of get her, her, the rest of her life in check. And, and similarly, you can, you can find a place where you're a little overwhelmed, but you know you're growing your skills and everything is focused on your career. So you have to, you know, I'm, I'm big on the holistic approach to your career and your life. You have to kind of step back and think of this as the big picture. Right now we're focused on your career, but all of this can kind of play into each other. I, I just feel like I rambled, Cassie. I don't know if I answered that question. But. No, that's great. It's kind of like I've, I've been thinking, you know, you want to be in your flow the whole time, but you're right. You know, some points throughout your life, you may not want to be in your flow in your career 100% of the time. So, no, that's really helpful. Yeah, it, it's really important to find time to, um, like, digest everything. You know, when you've just, I mean, think about school. If you were in final season all the time, you would never really have learned anything. You have to just kind of step back and process sometimes. And that's mm -hmm. what allows you to kind of recharge and grow and understand kind of what that next challenge needs to be. So it really is a constant practice of reflection, feedback, um, and then setting up the conditions to continue growing and increasing those challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks for answering that question. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, okay, we'll move on. We got two more conditions, and then we'll leave just kind of general um, questions about your career for sure. Focus. I said this is my favorite word, <laughs> um, and um, I, it really is. If you have to set up the prior three conditions, then the focus becomes easier, um, but not automatic by any means. So in today's world, especially, focus is so hard. Um, I've been reading and following a lot about how attention is a resource. It's really our most precious resource these days. And um, we need to preserve it because there are so many demands from devices, the internet, social media, um, and beyond just attention. You know, if you don't have attention and you can't ever do anything meaningful, 
um, focus leads to enjoyment, right? And that's why we're here. I want you to find enjoyment in your career and that takes focus. And to me, focus is the really the crux of flow. Um, so how do you get it? <laughs> the first thing I want you to know is that focus is a skill. It's a skill in itself. It's not inherent. Some people are great at it. Some people aren't. Um, but it does take practice. It doesn't just come. And you build it like you build any other skill, um, which which is creating a challenge that stretches your skills, right? Which is what we just talked about. And, and that's called deliberate practice, right? Creating actual challenging moments where focus is hard, but you really, fo but you do focus and that's how you grow. Um, I, and, and focus can be lost. So even if you feel like you had it, or maybe at one point you were a very focused person, um, it's just like any other skill or practice. You don't get to say, okay, great, I'm done. I don't have to practice. I'm focused. You have to continue working on it or you can lose it. So if you think about life before devices and the internet, if you're old enough, uh, it was actually quite easy to focus. As I, I love that picture of the um, woman in the library at the early, um, in one of the earlier slides, because I think of times in the library, I studied abroad in Cambridge, England, and I think of times in the library and like focus was so easy. I was constantly in the zone. Now, when we go to a library, we have laptops. So it becomes much more challenging and you have to continue to stretch that skill and really um, focus on focusing. <laughs> um, and, and we have much more clamoring for our attention. So this deliberate and consistent practice to um, to Con to continue to develop your skill uh, of focus is important. Um, one of my favorite ways is meditation. Uh, you don't have to do it, um, but it really does help. And it's to me, the number one game changer in my ability to sit and work and find a flow zone and focus on a problem and solve a problem is actually finding that consistent daily practice because meditation is just deliberate practice of focus, depending on the type of meditation you do. Mine is, I, I practice mindfulness. So exercise here, uh, just in general, I want you to rate your focus on a scale of one to 10, where one is, oh my gosh, I can't sit still for two minutes. I have to, I constantly flip back to Facebook. And 10 is, you know, what's Facebook? I, I can sit and work on a problem for hours. So just quickly rate your focus. And then no matter where you are on the scale, we all have something that distracts us. So identify what distracts you. Um, this could be uh, on two levels. So on a daily basis, the micro level, when do you lose your focus? I mentioned Facebook already, you know, notifications. I'm always surprised that people still have email notifications <laughs> on their computer because I don't know how you focus with those. My personal uh, distraction is online shopping. So what, what distracts you? Sometimes it's boredom. Sometimes it's anxiety. Sometimes it's just, ah, this isn't fun and shopping is more fun. And then once you've nailed that down on the daily micro level, on the macro level in life, when do you get distracted from bigger goals? So think of what might distract you from your one year goal you set yourself, you set for yourself at the beginning of this webinar. So on a macro level, what distracts you? Cassie, that's pretty good. Six to seven. <laughs> Thanks. I, I try. I, I try the meditation, but it's hard. It is hard. Yeah, it is hard. And it's a skill, right? Like it, it would, if, if it's not hard, then there's no purpose. So <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> about a four. Okay. A five. We're about in the, we're about in the middle. So then, so then ask yourself, you know, wh what, why do you get focused? Why is that number, that number? And, and just, you can write it down or you can type it in. This is nice. And then finally, how will you practice focus and how will you minimize distractions? So I already mentioned meditation. Um, that helps me build up my focus muscle. But if that's not your thing, consider an activity almost, you know, like I described at the beginning that naturally lends itself to focus and flow. So maybe you're learning something new. Um, maybe it's an art project, maybe reading. I, I'm a big fan of The Wire. I've watched it like three times at this point. And one of the characters there, he does little, um, he makes little dollhouse furniture. And it seems like such a silly thing, but he is one of the most focused um, characters. And I think it's because of that doll. I don't know if they 
if they were creating that character for me here, but, but that, that any activity that requires you to focus um, that naturally lends itself to flow will help you practice focus. Yeah, Hannah, I'm with you. Meditation each morning really, really supports, um, supports the day and helps you find that, um, find that focus. Yeah, Eleanor, Nora, those are totally reasonable um, distractions, macro distractions. Um, and, and I wouldn't even call those distractions, kind of like I was talking about earlier today. Those make sense. You needed to back off on whatever you were pursuing when um, disaster hits, when you have a, a big family loss, when you have someone you need to take care of. That makes sense. Um, and so that's where the feedback piece becomes really important to notice that you're off track and whether or not it makes sense to get back on track. Thanks for sharing that, Eleanor. Yeah, Hannah. Yeah, agreed. A lot of notifications are just hard. So so as you're considering how you're going to practice this focus and minimize distractions, you know, turning off notifications is great. But try not to just say, you know, try not to go on Facebook because that's not action. That's not action oriented. You could say instead, I will, I will turn off all notifications, like Hannah said, or I will install a plugin. I know my husband, he, he's, he's installed a plugin at work that actually requires like three additional steps to go onto Facebook. So he doesn't go onto Facebook at work anymore. Or if he does, he has to go to his phone. So it's just a little barrier that helps him focus. And uh, so really think about what you will do, not just what you want to happen, right? How will you actually make it happen? We got one more condition, and I do want to leave a little bit of time at the end for questions. So fi final condition, oh, we got a little animation, that's okay, um, is a sense of control. So um, all of this, all of these conditions for flow really help us get this possibility or feeling of control or um, have or actually having control. Um, the truth is you never really have control, but you want to feel like you have a control. So sense of control with your career. Um, and since we can never actually control our careers and lives, we want to reduce that sense that we can't as little as possible. So how do you do that? You can control um, you, possibility over actually actual actuality. So um, you control your um, subjective risks. So subjective risks are those that might happen. I'm sorry, subjective risks are those that come from a lack of skill, uh, which we've already addressed or a lack of preparation. But if you're really getting to the um, skills meets challenge piece, then that's great for you. And you prepare for objective risks. So you can't lose, which are those you can't control. So preparation, making sure the conditions are right for skills meets challenge. We identify obstacles. Um, Oh, my animation on this is all off. I'm sorry, guys. Um, we identify obstacles that you can prepare for um, to, to overcome as best as possible. And the point is to really start to minimize the subjective risks, the risks that come from a lack of skill, which we've already addressed, or a lack of preparation. Get those down to zero and then prepare or avoid the objective risks as much as possible. So everything comes from preparation, which is what we're doing right now in this hour. And hopefully you'll carry this thread. So the exercise is when are you in control? What are you in control of? Um, what are the subjective measures like the level of skill, the assertiveness to ask for that raise, the courage to quit? You know, what are you actually in control of in relationship to your goal for the next year and write it down? And then as you can see, the next question is, how will you control it? So how will you develop the skills? How will you actually ask? You know, can you even envision walking into your boss's office and, you know, write a script for how you're going to ask for a raise? How will you get the courage to quit your job if that's what you need? You know, what safety net do you need that you can be in control of? How will you control it? And then to get to those objective risks, you know, what is out of your control? This is a really long list, if you really think about it, but try to confine yourself here today to the big ones you foresee might happen over the next year. You know, what is out of your control that might just get you clear or that might just get you um, off track? Maria, not clear of the, um, of the first question. So what are you in control of in regards to the goal that you set at the beginning of this webinar? So you set a one year goal. 
what are you in control of? And, and by that, I mean your skills, um, actually asking for a raise, actually um, asking for a reduced work schedule. You know, what can you actually control? You were just trying to identify what you can control versus what you can't. Cool. Thanks. And then for all of those circumstances that are out of your control, how will you prepare for them? I want you to prepare as best as you can for the uncontrollable uncontrollable, like having a savings account, maybe getting a license for a backup career or a new skill that you can fall back on in case you lose your job, in case your company gets bought. What will you do to have a safety net and plan for what you can't control? And identifying what you can control and how you will control it. And then what's out of your control and preparing for that is what gives you a sense of control. Again, we can never control everything. Oh, truly, we, we can only control ourselves. <laughs> um, so you want that sense of control. And by preparing and thinking about this, especially over the next year, but in the longer term uh, trajectory of your career, you'll develop that sense of control, which makes finding flow much easier. Um, Finally, you know, finding flow. So we've gone through all of the conditions, the elements that get to the benefits. And what we've done today is we started to set the conditions. So obviously, this is just the start. But setting the conditions is really imperative. So remember, we rarely just fall into flow. We have to go find it and create it. And so these exercises that we do today, you'll get their recording. Continue doing them. Um, you want to make sure you're really consistently creating those conditions. Um, it takes constant practice and evaluation. I just said that consistently doing it. You don't get to just set the conditions and stop. You have to keep on evaluating them. It should become a part of your practice in your career. And then you need to have the courage to reevaluate it necessary, right? You don't want to be stubborn about your goals or stubborn about the path you're on. You are not a static being and the world is not static. So reevaluate, change things, change the conditions as you need to and as you change. If you do want to dig deeper into this topic, I really highly recommend this book, Flow. It's by the psychologist Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. It is super academic and heady, but I love it. Um, it goes in, into very deep detail through everything we described. Um, or you can always contact me. So here's my email address. I answer all my email. Um, my website is uh, alignment-coaching.com. And I find that the best way to stay connected is on LinkedIn. So you just search for Layla Hawk. I'm on LinkedIn and I will respond. But if you have any questions, we've got a few more minutes, whether it's specifically about flow or how to find this in your career or anything else. You know, I talk to people about their careers all day. So feel free to pick my brain. Awesome, Layla. This has been so great to spend this last hour with you um, and get all of these great questions to continue to ask ourselves as we you know, try to find flow at different times in our career. So thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. And, and my first question for you is, um, how do you break down a bigger goal? Like, for instance, getting a promotion, you may want to go for a promotion. And then how do you break it down so that you can measure that? Yeah, so how so you can actually develop that clear feedback system. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good example. I mean, so finding a promotion, you have to be specific on what the promotion is, right, and why it's meaningful to you. Um, and then depending on what it is, right, if it's to if it's to make more money or if it's just to advance and stretch yourself, mm. you need to take some time to actually identify what it's going to take to do to get there. So I, everyone's brains work differently, obviously. I like to think of the far goal and then back myself up. So if I want to be, if I want a promotion in two years, then what do I, what skills do I need to be demonstrating, you know, in the six months to a year before I want that promotion? And then I back up and say, okay, well, how am I going to get those skills? How am I going to demonstrate it? How can I make sure I get on the projects or create projects that help me develop those skills? Um, just, and then that helps you make sure that um, you'll actually get there. So I like to start at the end and work backwards. Some people like to go kind of one step at a time and think of where they're heading that way. So you either way, I think it helps to work in a logical time ways, either backwards or forwards. Um, and really just kind of think, okay, well, if I want to be there, then what, where do I need to be six months before, two months before, um, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's great. Definitely breaking it down and um, Eleanor is writing in who is the author of the book recommended. Yeah. 
I'm taking some time to type it out. Um, <laughs> I got the book in front of me. It's not that easy. So, um, <laughs> I can send it out to later, Layla. If you want to email that to me, I can include that yeah, in the follow-up email. For sure. Perfect. Um, and then people can just copy and paste. Pretty sure I got it relatively right there, Eleanor. <laughs> At least <laughs> right enough. <laughs> That's great. Um, perfect. And now, you know, you're, you're, uh, gave great advice on, you know, breaking a goal down. I'm wondering how much time do you recommend people spend on defining their clear goals and how much time to, um, spend on work journaling? Like what, you know, how much time does this entail? Yeah. Well, I think the first time around, you know, we just spent an hour. Hopefully you were uh, kind of writing it down and thinking about that. Um, you know, this is a really great beginning of the year activity, end of the year activity. Uh, take a few weeks, you know, to mull over a couple hours at a time to really think about your goals for the next year and how that affects your further goals. So I like kind of a big reflective period at some point. The, the end of year is arbitrary for most of us. So whenever works for you. But work journaling, you know, just a few minutes a day. I, you know, I know we've talked about this, Cassie, in other contexts. And um, I was just talking with another client of mine. Um, it doesn't have to be a big dramatic moment. You know, she said, look, I'm, I'm really finding the time to work journal. This is great. It's becoming a habit. But I don't feel like I have insights every day. Of course, you don't have insights every day. That would be exhausting. <laughs> so, so it doesn't have to be a big deal. It doesn't have to be a big dramatic dear diary moment or like I found, uh, you know, I found what I want to do today and it's different from yesterday every day. It does not have to be like that. It's just a check in. So, like I said, I, I think of it as your feedback system, but it's just a check in to make sure that you're still feeling good about where you're heading. You know, did today continue to put me on the trajectory that I want to be on or did something shift? Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's not dramatic. You know, it's like, yep, today, if, if every day was like today, I'd be happy or oh, I could get a little more challenge. I need to think about that next week. So um, it doesn't have to be a big dramatic moment, just a check in. Um, you know, my habit is I plan my day for the next day and I do a quick journal check in on the same page of a Actually, it's a Northwestern notebook um, and I drink a glass of wine. So it takes me about how long it takes to drink a glass of wine, which is 10 minutes. So it's not that long and it's enjoyable to me. And that's my reward to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. That's something tangible we can go and do mm -hmm. each day. So that's great, Layla. And we're getting really close to hitting one o'clock. But um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we end for the day? No, just, you know, um, if you, if you, do, again, I've said this a lot, but do email me. Uh, let me know if you have any thoughts or questions. I would love to, um, you know, help answer them uh, for, for, you know, any questions about this or anything else. This has been great. And thanks for listening. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks again, Layla. And thanks to everyone for joining us for today's presentation. You can find all of our upcoming and archived presentations at alumni.northwestern.edu backslash career webinars. Have a great rest of your day and go Cats!